Hello everyone, I am Dr. E.T. Aaron Thomas. In this short video session, I am going to discuss with you how to manage diabetes in patients with chronic kidney disease. This topic is very important because there are certain distinct differences in managing diabetes in patients with CKD than managing in general public. Let us see. Firstly, the management of diabetes is a bit challenging in CKD mainly because of frequent hypoglycemia. The reasons for frequent hypoglycemia in patients with CKD is one is decreased insulin clearance from the kidney. Normally insulin is cleared from the kidney. If patient is having chronic kidney disease, it is not cleared to the same extent like in general patients, general population predisposing the patient to hypoglycemia. Secondly, there is decreased gluconeogenesis in the kidney. Of the total gluconeogenesis, two-third is from the liver and one-third is from the kidney. This one-third contribution from the kidney is not adequate in patients with advanced CKD. Thirdly, patients with CKD have uremia because of accumulation of waste products that is normally excreted through the kidney. Many uremic toxins can suppress the appetite and this so CKD patients may not be taking adequate food at many instances predisposing him or her for hypoglycemia. Next reason is many oral anti-diabetic drug the drug itself or its active metabolites are renally eliminated. So, in patients with CKD, if you use these drugs, it can accumulate and predispose the patient for hypoglycemia. Lastly, if a patient is on hemodialysis, the dialysate which most commonly used is glucose free. So, during dialysis, there is a tendency for the blood glucose to come down because the glucose is taken into the dialysate compartment result uh, making the patient at risk for hypoglycemia during the dialysis. The reason for using glucose free dialysate is because the shelf life of the dialysate is increased if you use glucose free dialysate. If the glucose if the dialysate contains glucose it can get contaminated bacterial growth can happen. So in most of the dialysis centers the use is the uses glucose free dialysate. Another reason for the challenge is that there are some group of patients where it is very difficult to manage the blood sugar because blood sugar values goes very high because of insulin resistance. There are certain uremic toxins which binds with the insulin receptor resulting in insulin resistance. So there are two ways. Most patients there is a risk for hypoglycemia but there are some group of patients where through insulin resistance mediated through the uremic toxins we have, we face difficulty in controlling the sugar. Next difference or challenge in managing CKD is the HPA1C which we all consider as gold standard becomes less reliable in patients with advanced CKD. HPA1C measures the glycated glycosylation of the hemoglobin, glycosylation content of uh, percentage hemoglobin which is glycosylated and it gives the average 3 months average sugar value. But in CKD patients this is less reliable because of following reason. Reason number one, uremic toxins can result in carbomylated hemoglobin. This carbomylated hemoglobin interferes with the measurement of HbA1c and it can result in falsely elevated HbA1c. So even if the patient may have normal sugar or low sugar, we will get a high HbA1c in patients with advanced CKD because the carbomylated hemoglobin interferes with the assay and resulting in falsely high measurement. In patients with CKD, the lifespan of RBCs are less. Normal lifespan is 120 days, it is now less. So that means 
the there there will not be enough glycosylated hemoglobin in the blood so hba1c value can falsely come down even if the blood sugar values are high many patients with advanced ckd are on iron and erythropoietin this iron and erythropoietin erythropoiesis stimulating agents can uh, stimulate the production of rbcs and results in release of more number of new rbcs into the circulation which is not glycosylate glyco glycosylate and this results in falsely low hba1c even if the uh, blood sugar values are high there are certain patients with diabetic nephropathy who have alternating hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia because of gastroparesis diabetic nephropathy is a microvascular complication so hence these patients can also have other microvascular complications like diabetic autonomic neuropathy and diabetic gastroparesis is a characteristic feature of autonomic neuropathy and here the movement of the food in our gut in the gut of the patient is not proper and patient can have hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia alternatively because of erratic movement of the food to the gut this can be treated effectively by using prokinetic agents next difference in managing patients with ckd is there is a difference in the glycemic target which we aim for usual patients the glycemic control we uh, target an hba1c of 7% which is based on the results from uk pds the target is usually fixed by considering the risk benefit ratio that risk means risk uh, risk of hypoglycemia and benefit means prevention of micro and ma macrovascular complication based on this for usual patients it is 7 percentage uh, can we can even be more strict and come down to 6.5 percentage but for patients with advanced ckd the kidneys are already lost so there is no much point in aiming for a very strict glycemic control prevention of diabetic nephropathy which is one of the main microvascular complication is one of the main reason why we aim for a strict glycemic control but here the kidneys are already lost then why do you need to aim if you try for a aim if you aim for a strict glycemic control you are not going to preserve the kidney but you are going to place the patient at higher risk for hypoglycemia already patients with advanced ckd are at very high risk for hypoglycemia if you try for a strict glycemic control more hypoglycemic episodes can happen and it increases mortality and morbidity so our aim is to get only a reasonable glycemic control we don't want a strict glycemic control our main one another main aim is to prevent hypoglycemia the reasonable glycemic control for example let me tell we aim for a fasting blood sugar target of 120 to 150 and post meal target of 150 to 240 this range is in fact very high if we if we are planning for a strict control but i have kept or it is usually this higher target is kept for advanced ckd patient and don't give much emphasis for hba1c because of many many flaws in hba1c measurement in patients with ckd which i already discussed just before next major difference in managing patients with C, uh, managing diabetes in patients with ckd is regarding the use of oral anti diabetic drugs we all know that diet and lifestyle followed by metformin forms the found forms the foundation of diabetic treatment for type 2 diabetes but there are certain concerns with regarding metformin use in patients with ckd previously there was a label restricting the use of metformin in patients with serum creatinine more than 1.5 and for women with serum creatinine more than 1.4 that means we can only use metformin if the creatinine is less than 1.5 in male and less than 1.4 in female but this concept has changed now rather than a fixed or 
fixed creatinine cutoff, we have to use now GFR cutoff. If eGFR, that is estimated GFR, is more than 60, we can safely use metformin. If eGFR is less than 30, we should not use metformin. For patients with eGFR between 30 to 45, it is better to use only the half dose of metformin because metformin is renally eliminated and it can accumulate. So, we only half the usual dose of metformin will give the same benefit for patients with eGFR less than 45. Next is regarding sulfonylureas. The initial generation sulfonylurea, glibenclamide, which is still available in the market, has active metabolites that is excreted through urine. Hence, in patients with renal failure, these metabolites accumulate and makes the patient at high risk for hypoglycemia. So, better or I should tell avoid using glibenclamide in patients with chronic kidney disease. Next commonly used sulfonylurea is glimipride. Even though glimipride is metabolized by the liver, it has certain active metabolites which are renally excreted. So, there is some concern regarding the use of glimipride also. Hence, better restrict the use of glimipride in patients with only early CKD. Don't use it in patients with advanced CKD. Glibenclamide, don't use. Glimipride, use with caution. That too, only in patients with early CKD, not in patients with advanced CKD. Next two sulfonylureas, which is commonly available here, is glipicide and glipicide. These are metabolized by the, metabolized by the liver and are primarily excreted in the urine as inactive metabolites. Since these metabolites are inactive, it can be safely used in patients with CKD, even in advanced CKD. Another important fact we all need to understand while using uh, sulfonylureas is there is strong evidence telling that combining sulfonylurea along with the insulin can increase mortality. Patients with diabetic nephropathy generally have long duration of diabetes. Once a patient has long duration of diabetes, if it is type 2 diabetes, patient is in the beta cell failure state. If the patient is in beta cell failure state, even if you use cell sulfonylurea, there is no enough beta cells that can be stimulated to produce more insulin to get a sugar control. Hence, most often patient needs to be on insulin. So, if a patient with diabetic nephropathy is on insulin, do not use sulfonylureas along with the insulin because of the evidence telling that it can increase the mortality. Next group of drug is thiosolididiones, which the commonly available one here is pioglitazone. It is metabolized by the liver, not by the kidney, not excreted through the kidney. But the concern regarding the use of pioglitazone is it is associated with heart failure and edema formation. Patients with chronic kidney disease already are at, is at high risk to develop edema and also because of cardiorenal syndrome there is a complex interplay between heart and kidney making CKD patients at risk or prone to develop heart failure because of these two reasons because of the edema formation and associated heart failure risk better avoid pioglitazone or any thiosolidated ions. Now we also have a bladder carcinoma controversy tagged with thiosolidated ions. Next group of drug which is commonly used for general patient is DPP for inhibitors that is the gliptins. Of the various available gliptins, only linagliptin is excreted through liver. All other gliptins, alloglyptin, saxagliptin, citagliptin, vildagliptin, all the, all the remaining gliptins are renally eliminated. 
Hence, patients with advanced renal failure, we can only use linagliptin. Teldigliptin is a molecule which is commonly used in India. This is not displayed in the table and you, it is very difficult for you to find tenlegliptin in most of the textbooks because it is a Japanese molecule that is the reason why most of the western textbooks do not place tenlegliptin in it. Tenlegliptin is also renally eliminated. It can be reasonably used, reasonably safely used in CKD patients. Regarding the new agents, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, embagliflozin, dapagliflozin, canagliflozin and all. These agents are found to decrease the risk of develop, uh, progressing the diabetic, risk of progression of diabetic nephropathy, reduces the risk of hospitalization due to heart failure, can decrease the risk of CV events and death. Hence, SGLT2 inhibitors has now got a higher place in managing patients with diabetic nephropathy and based on the available evidence, it is the agent of choice for patients with diabetic nephropathy if EGFR is more than 30 percent, more than 30 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. The higher place of SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with CKD is not for the diabetic control, but it is for the additional benefits which already told decrease CV events, decrease risk of hospitalization due to heart failure, retards the progression of diabetic nephropathy. That's all. Thank you.